Hello everyone and welcome again. This is Mark and I'm here with my wife Holly and we're here to share with you some wonderful news. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is returning and we want to be ready. And today we want to share with you about what should we be doing while we wait for Jesus' return. The Bible actually tells us specifically what we're supposed to be doing and we're going to go through it today and this is so important for us to live a life where we are ready we're waiting we're looking we're expecting jesus to come back because he's coming back and and what you're going to hear today is that we do not know when he's coming back it says that he can come back at any time uh, it, it could be the morning it could be the night it could be any time we are supposed to be living ready at all times of the day at all all times of the night for Jesus's return because it says that we do not know when he's coming back and, and and the scriptures tell us that everything that had to be fulfilled for his return has been accomplished now what that means is that Jesus can come back at any moment literally as we are doing this program he can be coming back right at this time and so we want to be ready and so the scriptures tell us what we should be doing while we wait for Jesus' return. So we're going to share with you what God's Word says. He does, and this is, this is exciting news. And everybody, we all want our hearts ready. We all want to be watching and looking and waiting and anticipating His return. And that, that's where God's given us so many instructions and so many keys in His Word how, how we should be waiting and what should we should be busying ourselves with and what we should be doing. And He tells us in Mark 13, starting in verse 32, On that day or that hour not a single person knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father knows. So what does it say for you and I? It says, um, be on your guard, constantly alert, watching, praying, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man already going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his particular task. And he gives orders to the doorkeeper to be constantly, constantly alert and on watch. Therefore, watch, give strict attention, be cautious and alert. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Watch, I say, lest he come suddenly and unexpectedly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to everybody, watch, give strict attention, be cautious, active, and alert. And we see in this three times he tells us to be on your guard, to be alert, to be cautious, to be watching and waiting. And how do we do that? What does that mean for you and I? It means, you know, we're constantly having awareness. Jesus, your return is coming. Your return is near, Jesus. What do you want me to be doing with myself every day? He wants us to hear his voice. He wants us to be alert. He wants us. There's so many distractions right now all around us. I mean, from our jobs to our families to the pol the world, politically, you know, our community, so many distractions. And he's wanting us to be alert, to be watching, to be to be aware of him, to not be caught up with everything and just be caught up with what's going on and have your mind busying with that and have your mind busying with this and just being aware and worried. He wants us to be aware of him at all times. And right there it said to be on guard. You know, what does that mean? I mean, that you know if you're on guard, you have a check. You have an awareness. You have a watch on yourself because it says even in Ephesians 6 that that devil is constantly roaming around and seeing who, whom he can devour. So we know if God's telling us to be on guard, if God's telling us to constantly be alert and watching, then that means the devil's going to be trying to do the opposite to us. And that's what I see. Whenever God tells you to do something, the devil works the opposite to you. He wants you to be distracted. He wants you to be burdened down. He wants you to not be alert. Even where it said right there, he don't he doesn't want we don't want to come back and he finds you asleep 
he's not talking about you literally being asleep. He's talking about a, a dullness and a sway and a, and a stupor on you. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to have a stupor and, and you can go, you, you go places all the time and you see people. It just seems like they have a dullness and a stupor on them. They, they're just going through their day, just monotonous day in and day out. But that's not how he wants us to be. I mean, in, in first John, it says that the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And that sway is constantly there. That sway is that sleep he's talking about right there. He doesn't want you to be like that. He wants you to be awake spiritually. He wants you to be awake, alive in your spirit and awareness. And, and every day, it seems like in my life, I have even more and more of an awareness. I want to be ready when you come, Jesus. I want to be alert. I want to be watching. I want to be guarding my heart. When it says, be on your guard, you put a guard on your heart. You put a guard on your spirit. You don't want to let anything in there that would, that would, seduce you or make you not aware of him that would get you busy and burdened down and with the cares that I always have such an awareness, even a more an awareness every day, because you can see how bad things are getting, how bad the world's getting, how dark the world is getting. And, and he wants you to have even more of an awareness. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Be ready. Be ready when I get there. Be ready. Be doing what I tell you to do. And and I think of a good example of that in the Bible of people that were watching and waiting for him, watching and waiting for Jesus is in Luke chapter 2. And we'll look at that. And in in Luke 2 is this is the account of when when Mary and Joseph were going to take the baby Jesus to the temple. And we know the account that there was a man named Simeon there. And in Luke 2.25, it says that um, he was righteous and he had been looking at, for the consolation of Israel. He had been looking for Jesus. And he had been divinely revealed to him that the, he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ, the, the anointed one. He was looking every day. He was in that temple anticipating and waiting and excited because he knew that he was not going to die before he saw Jesus. And that was the life he lived. And then also at that time, there was a prophetess in the, in the temple and her name was Anna. And it says that she was very old and having lived her with her husband seven years from her maidenhood. And she was a widow for 84 years. She had been in that temple 84 years of her life as a widow. And it said she did not go out from the temple enclosure, but was worshiping night and day with fasting and prayer, waiting on the, on Jesus to appear. That, um, there's a key right there what God's telling us that he would have us be doing. Worship, worshiping him every day. That's what Anna was doing. And she longed and looked with excitement for the for the birth of Jesus. The Messiah was coming. And it said then, it says that she was also praying and she was fasting. And that's what God wants us to be doing too. Praying every day, Jesus we, we want to be ready, having a cry in your heart. And that's what she did. And it said she too came up at that same hour and she returned and gave thanks to God and talked to, G, talked to Jesus, to all who were looking for the redemption and the deliverance of Jerusalem. And that's what she was doing with her life. As she waited for 84 years, she was she was praying, she was fasting, she was praising, and she was returning thanks, giving thanks to God. And that's what we can be doing too. Jesus, we're so grateful for you. We want to be ready when you come. We're so excited and longing and looking for you. And I know, you know, if you're not able to say, Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, you need to examine your heart because that's what she was doing. She was giving thanks. She was worshiping, waiting, and longing. But if you can't do that, and if you can't say, Jesus, come now, come, Lord Jesus, come, you need to, you need to examine your heart why you can't say that. There's things in your life that are hindering you. There's things in your life that you need to get right. You need to turn to Jesus. Jesus, I want to be ready. Anything in my life that's that's wrong, I want it ready. I want to be prepared. I want to be have that excitement like like you see Simeon and Anna had that excitement. I want that in my life, Jesus, as I wait and look for you. And, you know, in verse 34, it gives us such a key uh, as it says, it is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his particular task. And he gives orders to the doorkeeper to be constantly on alert and on the watch. And, and so one of the things that 
we need to be doing is we need to be doing the particular task that Jesus has given to us. And as Holly read, uh, there are things that God is having you and I to do every single day. We just read about great examples of Simeon and Anna. And every day, Anna was in the temple and she was praying and worshiping and she was waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Now, Jesus has a plan for you. You actually have a particular task that Jesus has called you to do today and every day until Jesus returns. Uh, and God wants you to hear him. What is that particular task? Now, we can also see this same responsibility that we have in Matthew 24. And it actually says uh, in verse 44, it says, You also must be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time? Now, it says this, Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied is the servant whom when his master comes, he will find so doing. Now that's the key, is that God actually has put you and I in charge of certain things in his household. And he says he has given responsibilities to give food and supplies at the proper time. Now you and I actually have been designated by God to be in charge of his household, you have a responsibility in your yeah. life. Now, you have people in your life that you're responsible for, whether you're a father and you have a wife and you have children or you're a wife or you're a child to take care of your parents. Uh, you have responsibilities in your church that God has given you. You have responsibilities in your job that God has given you. But all of these things are particular tasks that God has put in in your life and we need to be listening god what task do you have me to do while i'm waiting for your return now now i've talked to many people who who want to do things for God, and they, they try hard, and they want to go, and, and some people just think they have to go out and do all of these great works, but actually what the Bible says is that the most important thing for us is that we do what He has called that's us to do. Uh, there's an account in Matthew 7 that's, that's very important. When we're talking about doing the particular tasks that God has told us to do, uh, in Matthew 7, Jesus says this, and this is very important. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, that's it. That's a very powerful statement. And, and when Jesus said this, uh, he's coming to the Jewish people, and here he is, the Messiah, and he's telling them, even though there's a lot of people there that were doing these works, the Pharisees did all of these great works, but he's saying to them, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Now, what that means is that when you go through your day and I go through my day, we can't just think try to do things that are good that's not going to help us and we're not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven we have to do what god is telling us to do what his will is for you and i and and the rest of this goes on it says many will say to me on that day lord lord have we not prophesied in your name and driven out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name and then I will say to them openly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. So there's actually people who will come and say, we prophesied, we've cast out demons. And Jesus say, will say, I never knew you. Right. Why? Because these people were not doing the particular tasks that God had ordained for them to do. Now, now whatever age you are, whatever your health is, whatever your abilities are, God still has a particular task for you. I, I know in our church we have 
elderly people. And some of them may maybe can't just hop in a car and get around and, and maybe go help people that way. But God has called them to pray. Yes. And we have a whole group of people and they meet and they pray uh, on, an, on a regular basis throughout mm -hmm. the week. And these people are doing the particular tasks that God has given them. Just like Anna was doing, these, the, these people in our church are doing what God has told them to do. They are praying and they are praying for God's will to be done in different situations and God is using them. We want to be faithful to the particular tasks. Now, you may be called to do a specific thing for God in the body of Christ. We all have different gifts. Some people have, as it says in the Bible, some people are actually gifted to teach. Some people are gifted to be servants. Some people are gifted to be pastors. Some people are gifted to be evangelists. But God has called every single one of us right. to be ministers for God, to be able to share the truth of Jesus Christ in the way he's called us to do. And, and you have people in your life that you're with every day. Uh, you may have people in your job. You may have people who, who you're in your family. But God wants you to be listening to him. What is the task that God has set before you? Whatever that task is, it is important. Don't let the devil tell you it's not important. Don't let the devil tell you when you go to work every day and you're where God's placed you and you're doing your day-to-day -day work and you're giving your heart to Jesus. Don't let the devil tell you it's not important. Right. We want to be doing the tasks that God has called us to do. That's right. And in Matthew 25, it also talks about this. And this is such an important account about doing the particular tasks that Jesus has called us to do. In Matthew 25, verse 13, it says, Watch therefore, give strict attention, and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. For it is like a man who was about to take a long journey, and he called his servants together and entrusted them with his property. Now, this is the parable of the talents. You may be familiar with it. And it goes on and he says that he gave certain amount of talents to one servant. And then he gave another amount of talents to another servant. And he gave another to another servant. And then in verse 19, it says, Now, after a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with them. So what happens is Jesus is giving this illustration about a master who returned and and required of these servants to give an account. What did you do with the talents right. I gave you? And each one would give their response. And, and there was one servant who actually was given one talent and he buried it. He did not do anything with that talent to, to generate more talents, to generate some type of profit and productivity. And the master said... To that servant, uh, he said in verse 26, You wicked and lazy and idle servant, did you indeed know that I reap where I have not sowed and gather grain where I have not winnowed? And he goes on and it says he took away the talent from him. Now, God has given you and I talents. He has given you gifts. He's given you special things in your life that God wants to use to help other people. And God wants you to be faithful to use that gift. Mm -hmm. Now, we all have different gifts. Uh, I have gifts that Holly doesn't have and she has gifts that I don't have. But God wants us to use the talents that we have, the gifts that he's given us faithfully for, yes. and he will come back and he will actually ask us to give an account for that. And, and I know I want to be able to answer him and say, Lord, you gave me these gifts and these talents, and I am showing you what I did with this. You, you gave me these truths. You gave me your love, and I'm sharing, and I share it with the people around me. I shared your truth with the people. I listened to you when you said go and you told me to speak to this person. I did it. And that is so important for us. Every single day, some days I pray, God, bring me to the people or bring the people to me that you want me to have contact with today. When you're at the grocery store, are you watching and listening and, and saying, God, is there anybody that I need to share with today at this grocery store? Even a simple word of, of just 
thankfulness to them, appreciation, or sharing with them God's love can change somebody's life. So we go through our day and every single day there's people in our life who we come in contact with. But are we doing the particular tasks that God has ordained us to do and we're looking and we're watching for those opportunities of the people we come in contact with every single day? Yes, and I mean that's so important and all of these are things that are steps and our examples and our instructions that God has given us as we wait and long and look for his return. I know you just saw we each have tasks we're supposed to be doing. We each we need to be guarding our hearts, you know, which is like protecting ourselves and making sure keeping a watch on our spirit. And it says in Ephesians 6 another thing that God wants us to be doing. In Ephesians 6:18, it says pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. And to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of the saints, God's consecrated people. So he tells us right there, such a key in our life for us to be doing every day is praying. He tells us praying at all times, praying in every situation. And if you're keeping a life of prayer and you're keeping an awareness of prayer, it, it that is a protection of you. That is a keeping an open ear and an open heart for God to speak to you. Because when you pray and you cry out, the Bible says he answers you. It says he, what person asks of their father for bread and he'll give them a stone. He won't. If you ask God and you pray for people and you pray for situations and you pray for yourself, it says right there, he He will hear you. He will answer you. He will guard and protect you. And I know it was right. It says interceding in behalf of all the saints. And God has put people in our life. He has put spouses. He has put parents. He has put children. He has put co-workers. He's put people we don't even know in our that we just see and our hearts are touched with them. He's put people in our lives all the, all around us that he wants us to intercede on behalf of them. And our pastor always tells us the only thing we can take with us to heaven is each other. We can't take anything materially. We can't take any possessions. The only thing you can take and the only thing I can take is people around us. That's why he wants us to be interceding on behalf of them, crying out to God for our lives, praying and crying out to God for our family. We want to make it to heaven together. We want to be... We, we want to pray for those that don't know Jesus. I mean, you go places. I mean, I go places all the time, and I'm touched with, with, the, with the needs and the hurts of other people. And when you feel that prompting and you see that and God prompts you, he, that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to be praying for them. I mean, today I got a phone. I got a text message from a friend. Her son was taking a test. Please pray for him immediately. It, I stopped right then. Jesus, please help him right here on that on that test. God, if you bring in this across my path, you want me to pray for it. And all that does is causes us, it, it's an awareness. It's an awareness of Jesus. It causes us to be prepared and have an awareness of heaven at all times, have an awareness of God in our life. And I and and that's what he wants you to do. You you get messages from people, I'm sure, in your life. Pray for me right now. Pray for someone that's sick. Pray for this situation. And that's what it means about praying at all times in all manners of prayer until the end. It, ca- it causes an alertness. It says right here, it causes an alertness on you. And then it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish, pass away, and the works that are upon it shall be burned up. And since all these things are thus in process, and Mark told us in the beginning, everything has been fulfilled that needs to be fulfilled. So it is in process of being dissolved. What kind of person ought each of you to be in the meanwhile? How should you be? How should I be? It says to be consecrated and holy behavior, devout and godly qualities. He wants us to live a life of holiness while you wait and earnestly long for, expect and hasten the coming of the, uh, the day of God. And he want that is that is the most important thing. He wants us to live holy behavior, devout, godly qualities. And it says you know, in Hebrews 12, that without holiness, no man will see him. He wants us to strive every day for that holiness. And how do we do that? We ask him. We listen to him. We're aware of what he has to say. We don't know how to be holy. We don't know holiness, but he is 
who is holy. God's holy. His son is holy. And he's the one that can teach us how to live holy. I can't do it and you can't do it. But if we ask him every day, to, Jesus, we want to hear your voice. We want to know what you have to say about this situation, what you have to say about this task, what you have to say about this subject. He will teach us holiness. And just like I said, if you ask him, He will teach us. And John 5.30 is such a key example of that. Jesus teaches us in John 5.30 how to live holy. How it is, is we listen to his voice. We don't make a decision. We don't make a plan. We don't make a, a, a choice before we hear his voice because Jesus didn't do that. It says, as he heard his father's voice, he did it. And that's how we learn holiness. That's how we learn to live in godliness and holiness is by asking him and listening to him, not making a plan, not making a decision. I mean, we don't want to be somewhere he didn't tell us to be and he comes back. We don't want to be in a situation. I mean, we have seen there's so much danger, so many destructive situations, car accidents, shootings. We don't want to be in a place that God didn't tell us to be and his return comes. Or we don't want to be in a place where he didn't tell us to be and destruction comes on us. And that's how we should live in John 5 30. Hearing Jesus, do you want me to go to this place right now? Do What is your plan? Every day asking him every morning, God, what is your plan for me today? And it's not just starting. We start out asking him, but we don't stop there. That doesn't cover us the whole day. Well, I asked him in this today to help me every minute, keeping that awareness. That's how, that's how Jesus lived. And because of that, he was never separated from him. He, he shrank from that because he, he listened to his voice. There was no separation because he cared what God had to say. And if Jesus was our example of living like that, how, how much more should we live like that too? He set that example and that's how he wants us to live. And, you know, one of the things that we see here is that it says that Jesus will come back like a thief in the night. And, we, and we've heard that over and over that we don't know when he's coming. And if Holly just read... One of the things that God wants us to be doing while we're waiting is to live a holy life. It says, being consecrated in holy behavior. Now, as Holly said, what is Jesus going to be finding us doing when he returns? And and I want to go even a step beyond that and, and ask ourselves, what is going on in our hearts? What is going on in our thoughts when Jesus returns? When we talk about holiness, uh, it, it has to do with a submission in your heart, listening to the voice of God and letting the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit inside of us, convict us and lead us into that holy lifestyle. Now, part of holiness is actually going into the issues of our heart and making sure our heart is pure before God, making sure our thoughts are pure before God. And so when when we hear this, that we're supposed to be living a life that's consecrated and holy, that goes down to the issues of our heart. That goes down to the issues of our mind. What are we thinking every right. single day? When Jesus comes back, what is your heart condition going to be? Are you going to have anger and bitterness? Are you going to have sins of the world, pleasures, lusts? Or are you going to have the purity and holiness and longing for Jesus' return? That's right. And that's what he wants us to be do. He doesn't want us to be caught up and worried. And it says in verse 15, Beloved, since you are expecting these things, be eager to be found by him at his coming, without spot or blemish and at peace. Peace. What the world needs today is peace. In serene confidence, free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. We don't have to be agitated. We don't have to be worried. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be burdened with financial concerns. We don't have to be burdened with physical concerns. It says he wants us to have peace and serene confidence. And and that is such a key because everywhere you go right in, in your life and everywhere you see around you is agitation, is concerns, is worries about the economy, worries about finances, worries about things that are happening. He, he says right here, be eager to be found in him and his coming. Be at peace. Don't be worried. And be 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 conscious. And one other one other thing he tells us in Revelations, he says, he's talking to the church, and I think this is so key because 
the church needs to be ready. And he tells us in Revelations 3, 1, this is a church that wasn't ready. It was a church in Sardis. And it's, he says, I know your record that you are doing. You're supposed to be alive, but in reality, you are dead. And right there, we want to ask Jesus, am I alive? Am I ready? Or am I actually really dead? Ask him, Jesus, I don't want to think I'm ready and I'm not ready. He says, rouse yourself, keep awake and strengthen yourself. That, and and it reinvigorate what remains and is on point. And I and I want to find you ready. It says, call to mind the lessons you've heard. Lay them to heart. Obey them. He wants us ready. He doesn't want his church to be found asleep and not ready and actually dead. He wants his church, his people, us to be ready. That's right. And we are out of time, but we want to encourage you today. Live a life doing what you should be doing, as yes. we just read while we wait for Jesus's return. And so thank you again for listening. And we are on this program Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8.30 to 9. Have a great day.